basically the front to back. It's so refreshing to walk into a building that seems to say it's okay for your mind to have to latch onto other things. We get that your mind needs more things than just this one person preaching the Bible. It takes so much more in order for us to all sort of find our place in God. Beautiful artworks that are housed in a sanctuary are doing exactly that. They are embodied forms of adoration that, that the onlooker gets to participate in or gets to find themselves in. It's usually so alienating to like sit down in a place and think, okay, now I have to worship. Like, how do you, how do you get yourself to do that? How does the human being move themselves toward the divine unless we have access through what's beautiful? and what's good and, and things that convey something true. I just think that artists have this fascinating correspondence with the divine and with the world. There's something physical about art always, right? Or even the way that the choir sings. The oral beauty of the space, the visual beauty of the space, like all of that has to do with how good it is to have bodies and to have senses and, and worship should be sensory. We, in, I think, in the evangelical and reformed tradition, have put the emphasis on brain on a stick, kind of over-intellectualizing, over-lecturing, too much emphasis on the word, the spoken word, and the written word, and less on the visual, the touch, the smell, the taste, which is critical if you're going to have a total worship experience. I, I find the, the pictures an enormous aid to what's actually being spoken, what's being preached, what's being sung, what's being celebrated. When you're hearing something from the pulpit, and when, where I sit, I can look at the crucifixion, I can look at the Annunciation, I can look at the Sub Poncio Pilato under Pontius Pilate, and it just makes it more real, more in-depth more vibrant. And it may also be because we're easily distractible. And this, the visual stuff brings it back. You need to see it as well as hear it, touch it, feel it.
So I've come to understand my interest in doing sacred art. I used to buy into the argument that it was uh, culturally conservative, that you know, I would be conservative by wanting to do Christian art. But my point has always been, what school am I conserving? What Canadian tradition can you point to that you see being represented here? Who are these great Christian artists that I'm supposedly conserving? I'm not. It, it, it's archaeological. I'm going back into time and then going through that period of art history and going back to the original source of what caused this artistic revolution. Going back to, to the biblical text, being creative in, uh, I guess, a kind of hermeneutical creativity in under, trying to understand what is going on, which is leading to answering the question, what is this actually about? And, and also a very important question, and this is the rhetorical question, and that is, what is it doing? And what is it doing to readers and audiences? And what is your visual interpretation, your visual exegesis, doing to audiences? What we call socio-rhetorical interpretation in biblical studies is something that's been developing for 35 years or so. The real leader in this is, is a scholar and a good friend of mine, his name is Vernon Robbins. In more recent years, a number of us have been working with him in developing ideas. But uh, socio-rhetorical interpretation takes the notions in the word pretty seriously. So that's the, the social or sociological part and the rhetorical part. So rhetoric is always about persuading, about persuading people using language and persuading people using visual artistic things as well. Uh, and and the, the social, sociological part is trying to take into account all the things that go on in the world that, that have to do with producing the rhetoric and the persuasiveness. The first time I got this canvas up and Larry was over and we were discussing sort of how to move forward and, uh, and then he left and then, uh, and then I was kind of panic stricken in terms of like, I, I, there was, there was going to be a lot of figuring out. There's like, you know, these are original compositions. The theology behind them is, uh, it's motivated by, it's, or it's theologically driven, not visually driven. So I'm coming up with the theology first and then figuring out ways to sort of demonstrate that visually. I wanted it to, to be really clean because when you leave things really clean, you can make decisions like this. Like, you know, there's no underdrawing there to sort of dirty it up, it's just like exposed canvas. So what I did is I decided, let's draw it here. Uh, let's figure everything out on the plastic. Some people see photorealism as the development from old master realism. In some ways, photorealism is the antithesis because what it is is it's, it's a machine's interpretation of reality. You're taking the camera and then you're basing your artwork on a camera's hermeneutic, almost, like a, a mechanical hermeneutic of reality. The great things have been done with painters, with photographs. I use photographs, but my relationship to photographs has changed over time. And part of that has been to look at a Titian or a Rembrandt not through the lens of technical sophistication or uh, technique or how real is it, how did they do it so realistically, but looking at those artists as uh, their real mastery occurs in their ability for visual exegesis, the exegetical skill that they pull out of a text. People who typically have no interest in painting will love Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. And it is a great painting, it's painted beautifully, but why does that image so specifically draw people in? And why has it been interpreted so profoundly when you have gifted people that will see that image in their mind and then to take that photograph they create in their mind from the text and then have the, the ability to make other people see it. The image in their mind has become, uh, the immaterial image has become a material reality. As an artist, you develop your own idiom your own uh, nuancing, your own shaping of things to 
interpret the text. And the interesting thing is that in that interpretation, though it's creative and new and different because it's not the same as Rembrandt, uh, it's still true. These images were made with oil bar, which is a big stick of oil and wax. The intensity of the pigment gives you rapid execution. Once you touch the canvas, you have this instant saturation of this Prussian blue pigment. This medium lets me work as fast as I can process, as fast as I can think. So the viewer is seeing my real-time invention. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a labored technique. I think about it, I, I prepare for it, I, I take extensive measures to uh, give me the highest likelihood of success. But then once you commit to making it, it is mostly panic. It is like the fear of failure is uh, um, intoxicating. You can't make any mistakes. This medium has no going back. Everything you see there is the first time I did it. There's no restatements, there's no corrections. It's just all real time, drawing and painting at the same time. And so, and then you're describing the light, you're describing the anatomy, you're describing the composition. And I feel like my years of abstract painting are coming through in this very figurative work. Like that flash of the asymmetrical cross in that composition, it's a very abstract space that that image interacts in. And I think it's really powerful in that environment, that's that Prussian blue up against the white sort of exploding visually in front of you. In the crucifixion picture, it's a creation vision as well with Christ above the chaos of, you know, of creation. To, a bit harder to, you know, to grasp that in the, the balance of the sub Pontio Pilato under Pontius Pilate with the two, who am I, Christ or Barabbas in this kind of judgment picture. But I, I like you know, complexity because it, it means those works of art are going to continue to speak to people over time, over generations, which is good.